I'd like to thank all of you for coming out, and before we begin, I would like to thank uh, the, the par uh, School of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, especially David Yells, uh, for helping me fund this event, along with uh, Michael Minch and the Peace and Justice Studies, uh, David Keller and the Utah Democracy Project, and uh, Michael Shaw uh, from the uh, Honors Department for helping us bring out uh, Dr. Parenti. Uh, to speak to you. So um, the current panel is going to be, uh, sorry, let me get my papers in order here, uh, The High Cost of War, Capitalism and War Profiteering. And we're, uh, we're very lucky today. Uh, we have both Michael Parenti and Michael Minch. Michael Parenti received his PhD in politi uh, political science from Yale University and has taught at uh, numerous colleges and universities. His 23 books include The Face of Imperialism, God and His Demons, Contrary Notions, The Michael Parenti Reader, uh, The Assassination of Julius Caesar, and Democracy for the Few, 9th edition. Portions of his writing have been translated into 20 languages and have been used extensively in college courses. More than 350 articles of his have been published in scholarly journals, magazines, newspapers, uh, books of collective reading, and online publications. He lectures frequently across North America and abroad. Tapes of his various talks and interviews have played, been played widely on community radio stations and public access television. He has an online blog. He has won awards from various academic and social activist organizations and has served on advisory boards for the uh, Project Censored, Educators Without Borders, the uh, Jasonovic Foundation, and several scholarly publications. For further information, you can visit his website at www.michaelparenti.org. Um, Michael Minch has received a PhD pro uh, program in political thought from the University of Utah. He works in political and moral theory, and in particular, uh, in the connections between them. He has worked on the relation between theology, political theory, and political commitments. Additionally, he has done work on democratic theory, uh, theories and practice of peace building, human security, violence, global justice, political ecology, and the, more, uh, the moral theories of liberalism, communitarianism, and socialism, and Christian politics and economic ethics. He's also taught on numerous occasions a course on uh, war and ethics, which if you have an opportunity, I'd highly recommend that you take. And again, so uh, let me just have you welcome uh, Dr. Michael Parenti, and again, my personal friend, uh, Dr. Michael Mitch, and let's thank them both for being here. <laughs> I'm Parenti, that's, I'm Parenti, that's <laughs> Mitch. We're both Michaels, so, so it's easy. Um, I want to talk to you. i start with a, uh, a clip I just saw the other night on YouTube. You can find it. I don't know what would be the way to, to Google it, but it's Donald Rumsfeld. Donald Rumsfeld was George W. Bush's Secretary of Defense. And he's standing there and he's saying, we are facing a menace. And the menace is internal, not from outside. And the menace is the Pentagon bureaucracy. Now he's head of the Pentagon. And that's rather extraordinary, you know. It was one of those moments of truth. Uh, very rare for Rems Rumsfeld. And he pointed out that according to some estimates, we cannot track over the last 10 or 15 years, we are unable to track 2.3 trillion, trillion, that's a thousand billion, 2.3 trillion dollars in transactions in the Pentagon. So there are these enormous sums that just get lost or unaccounted for. I saw then a Pentagon um, official who was trying to Look, look and see where this money is going. He said, I'm trying to trace 250 million, which is a mere pittance. And he said, I, I, I can't, uh, it's, it's, it's gone, it's disappeared. Now, now 2.3 trillion doesn't disappear. You know, that's a big chunk of money. All of that money could have been used for things that we desperately need on the domestic front. Um, when Bush called for $48 billion in new defense spending, George Bush, Listen to what retired Vice Admiral Jack Shanahan had to say. 
How do we know we need 48 billion since we don't know what we're spending and what we're buying? If you took the, if you took the, uh, the misplaced funds that the Pentagon uh, has around, if you, if you took that money and you had applied it to state and local governments, we would have been able to pay every state debt, every municipal debt uh, in the United States, plus having money left over for education and medical care and housing and the like. So this is the deprivation that we're suffering here. Now imagine if this was Social Security. Imagine if someone got up and said, um, well, there's about a hundred billion dollars in Social Security we can't find. Why you would have, can you imagine what the, the right wingers would have been whacking away and talking about how we, uh, we got to get rid of that program. It doesn't work and it's terrible and the taxpayers' money is being stolen and so forth. Other ways, there are other things that happen too. In the actual allocations of specific weapon systems, the Army allocated $1.5 billion to develop a heavy lift helicopter, even though it already had heavy lift helicopters. And the Navy was building an almost identical one. Now, that's not so stupid. It's stupid, it's crazy, it's wasteful if, if you're a taxpayer. You got the wrong glasses, no wonder you're all looking so funny. <laughs> no, we just look. <laughs> we just look funny. It's it's not it's it's stupid, but it's not stupid if you're a defense contractor. If you're a defense contract contractor, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to have duplicate contracts. It's wonderful to have to to do that sort of thing. Um, the Air Force started to develop a, an A twenty two fighter plane in nineteen eighty six that cost. $29 billion, one fighter plane, $29 billion, and it was still not combat ready 20 years later in 2005. Still not ready 20 years later. Again, that might be unfortunate if you're a taxpayer, but it's not, it's, it's beautiful if you're a, if you're a um, contractor. Um, defense contractors, Oh wait, here's another one. The Government Accountability Office, one of the best agencies in government, they do investigations of all sorts of, of uh, suspicious, critical, wasteful, corrupt things throughout the federal government. They're not, they're not a part of the government. They're actually connected to Congress. The GAO it used to be called the General Accounting Office. They've changed their name more accurately now. They're called the Government Accountability Office, a watchdog agency for Congress it reported that the Pentagon had no sure way of knowing how $200 billion was spent waging war in Iraq and Afghanistan. In Iraq, Halliburton and other contractors were repeatedly paid for work never performed. They grossly overcharged the Pentagon for fuel supplies, construction, meals for troops, and equipment, and delivering substandard equipment, contaminated water to U.S. bases. Two members of Congress concluded that Halliburton was systematically overcharging on hundreds of requisitions every day with enormous cumulative cost to the taxpayer. Halliburton was one army contractor. Halliburton is completely out of control. But you know what? Not a single Halliburton official has gone to jail. Not a single one has been called onto the carpet. And Halliburton still gets uh, government contracts. Halliburton happens to be Dick Cheney, the former Vice President Dick Cheney's corporation, too. Um, defense contractors enjoy what are called cost-plus contracts. They get paid whatever it costs to do a job, plus a guaranteed profit. So no matter, so to be wasteful, to find, to have tests that fail, to go back and redo the whole thing, that's fine. I mean, waste, incompetence, duplication, all these things are rewarded with more contracts and more profits. Uh, and again, the only reason they get away with it is because it's our military. Oh, the military. Don't you criticize the military. Oh, the military. They're the only thing that keeps us safe. Uh, the only reason you can say these critical things, I've had this said to me a number of times, is because of the U.S. military defending our shores, and that's 
Otherwise, you, you would have long ago succumbed to the threats or the dangers of uh, one, one horrible uh, vic uh, enemy after another. I don't know why we have so many enemies. Denmark doesn't have all these enemies. You notice that the terrorists aren't charging there. The, it used to be in my generation, the communists, 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 communists going to get your mama, you know, communists under the bed, communists everywhere. Um, small items too. Now this has gotten publicity. The media likes this because it's easy and simple to grab. The military paid $511 for light bulbs that cost 90 cents. They paid $640 for toilet seats that cost $12. Uh, this is the best one I was able to find. The Boeing company were paid by the Pentagon $5,096 for two pliers. Pliers, you know what pliers are, two pliers. Then the tough Pentagon procurers renegotiated the price down to $1,496, a real bargain. $1,496 for, for two pliers. Um, uh, defense, defense spending is really quite marvelous. It's, it's non-competitive bidding. So the price, mo, mo, not, not all contracts, but 80, 80, 85 percent of the contracts, there's no competition in the bidding. So the price you put up is the price the Pentagon will pay you. Um, there's no risk to speak of. It's a contracted market already, unlike, say, the auto manufacturer or someone who's manufacturing refrigerators who's worrying about, you know, selling these refrigerators after they come off the line. Uh, the, the weapons dealer has a guaranteed contracted market. This thing has been paid for already. The Pentagon is going to buy it no matter what shape it's in or how much it costs. Um, <clears throat> Guaranteed cost overruns. A cost overrun is I get a contract with the Pentagon and it's for $10 billion to build whatever, something that will deliver death more effectively on a little village somewhere off in the world. Um, and instead of $10 billion, I say, gee, you know, this is really going to cost me $13 billion. And the Pentagon says, oh, I had enough, three, three more. And it goes a little further and say, gee, this is a cost overrun. Uh, it's going to cost me more like uh, 20 billion. That's 100% cost overrun. It's a very common thing. Cost overruns from 100% to 700%. The, the classic example was the C58, uh, C5A transport plane, which was contracted for $4 billion. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it had a cost overrun of $4 billion. This was way back when $4 billion could buy something. And the, and the wings kept falling off anyway. Uh, we shouldn't laugh, but uh, that was, <clears throat> that was rough. that's what it was. And, and in, uh, defense spending is also very capital intensive. In other words, it doesn't create that many jobs. Uh, $1 billion spent on the military will create about 8,500 jobs. One million spent on health care creates almost 11,000 jobs. One million created, one billion, I'm sorry, I'm saying one billion for each of these, on mass transit is almost 20,000 jobs. Um, to put military spending in perspective, consider that the $800 million that Congress saved, 800 million, not billion, talking peanuts now. In 1997, they saved $800 million by cutting supplementary security income. That's income for disabled and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> people, uh, uh, disabled children actually. This particular cut was cutting this supplementary income for 150,000 disabled children. It amounts to less than one-third the cost of building and maintaining one B-52. Um, Two-thirds of the increase in the national debt over the last 15 years has come from military spending. So while they keep talking, while the GOP gets up and keeps talking about this debt, this national debt, this debt we've got to work out, they leave out the fact that, that two-thirds of it is due to military spending or related military spending, like veteran spending, like interest on that portion of the military uh, debt, and so forth. 
The national debt is a way, the bigger that debt, it's a, the, the less money you get for your tax dollar. The national debt is a way of privatizing the federal budget. Larger portions of your tax dollars goes to pay off rich creditors rather than being spent on social needs and social services. The biggest deficit spenders have been Republican presidents, Ronald Reagan, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, and, 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 and W. W. Bush. Um, when Ronald Reagan came into office, the national debt was $800 billion. He jacked up that military budget, so by the time he left, the national debt was over $2.5 trillion. George Herbert Walker, the old man, that the older Bush, when he came in, he, that, in, in four years, that, that debt went from two, two and a half billion to about five, I mean, two and a half trillion to about five trillion. Um, under, un, un, under, under Clinton, the debt pretty much held, and he even had one or two years where he had a surplus. Under George W. Bush, he spent, and the goal was to, as, as Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan once said, who's not a hero of mine, but he got up in the Senate and he said, this is a conspiracy, a conspiracy to spend and spend this country into a hole so that we will be forced to cut back on the social wage, cut back on social programs, cut back on Medicare, Medicaid, so, uh, public housing, uh, all these things. Um, by the time George W. Bush never vetoed a single spending bill, by the time he left in eight years, the national debt had gone from five trillion to something like twelve trillion, and now it's higher than that. It's fourteen trillion as as Obama spends here and there. <clears throat> um, more debt. And bigger spending this way means less money also for state and local governments. The empire feeds off the republic. The empire, and this U.S. empire, which now in every corner of the world makes port on every continent, has military bases just about everywhere, even Central Asia, places we never dreamed that we were going to have bases now, uh, which is now bombing about six countries. It's supporting uh, surrogate armies of other countries to kill their populations. It's involved in torture and in, in, in kidnapping and whatever else. That empire costs money, and it gets that money from the republic. Uh, the empire feeds off the republic. And the more money it gets from the republic, the less money there is for things like schools, daycare centers, uh, ma a rational mass transit system. Uh, cleaning up pollution, and, and name all the things we, we, we need uh, for, for disability. I have a friend who's seriously disabled. She gets $850 a month. Uh, she can't work, you know. Uh, $850, you can live in, in Berkeley, California, where I live. You can live on $850 on a bench pretty comfortably if you're willing to take a park bench, which, which they won't let you stay all night on a park bench anyway. But that's, but that's it. She'd be out on the street if, she, if it wasn't for the help that she gets from, some of, uh, from one of her friends. Um, but, but it's just disgraceful, it's outrageous what, what the situation is in America today. There are people who are working, who are, who are in, in real serious pain, who, but who can't afford to retire and such. Um, so states and cities are singing into poverty. I go all over... Uh, Give me a flash of time. I've talked too long. Should I stop right now? I'll, I'll wrap it up right here. But I just want to say, I, I go all around the country speaking, and sometimes I always feel I'm in the same place when I pick up the local paper. It always says, you know, city council cutting budget, uh, state, state assembly uh, facing larger debt, the, the deficits here, blah, 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 uh, closing down this. The city of Oak, uh, Oakland, which is right next to Berkeley, where I live in, in California, the city of Oakland is just closing 14 of their 18 <coughs> libraries, you know, uh, their, their library centers. When I was a kid, I, I was raised in uh, New York City, East, East Harlem, um, Italian Harlem. It, it was an Italian working class neighborhood. Um, I was a street kid, but I tell you, the public library was like a, a refuge, an oasis. When I got tired of the, hanging around the pool room or the handball court or 
or the street, I would go to the library, not for any great intellectuality, but it was just a place where you could read about other worlds and other things and adventures and stuff. And um, it was a wonderful thing, I thought. And the public library is a socialist institution. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow as one of the alternatives. We got, we got socialist institutions staring us right in the face. In fact, you're attending one right now, isn't this a public school? Which they keep privatizing, it, of course. By, they keep privatizing by, by raising your tuition. That's a way of, of piecemeal privatization of a, of a, of a social uh, public institution. So all of this, all of this is, is, is going that the qualities of our lives are palpably being affected. And that's happening because the empire feeds off the republic. And that's what military spending is all about. It's a tremendous cash cow for corporate America. It's the single greatest source of profit for them, and they're not ready to give it up. And it's got this sacred, it's a cash cow, but it, and it's also a sacred cow around it that you don't touch the military, you don't criticize the military. You see this super committee that Obama uh, suggested of 12 Congress people, one of them, the Republican guy, a senator, I guess, he's already threatening to quit because people in, on the committee have actually put it on the agenda that there's going to be cuts in defense spending. He would not even countenance that. We, we won't be safe. You're going to leave us unsafe. So they play, upon, they play upon the fears of the public. And once people are afraid that somebody's going to get them, once the leader has been demonized, a Milosevic, a Saddam Hussein, <coughs> uh, uh, Gaddafi, Noriega, uh, and so forth, once you convince them that their hearth and home is in danger, they will surrender their rights and they will give you all the money you need uh, and, and even more than you need. So that's the pretty picture I'm, I'm presenting. And, and, and if you're not depressed enough, we can hear from uh, <laughs> yeah. Professor. All right, I'll do my best to depress you more. <laughs> Greg, thank you for organizing this conference, and thank you for inviting Dr. Parenti, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So I took my task to speak about the relationship between capitalism and war, and then I'll add a little bit about war profiteering at the end, although I won't say much because you, you focused on that. Uh, you're mentioning, by the way, um, Patrick Monaghan's uh, protest and uh, the, the, uh, his, his word about a conspiracy to bankrupt America remind, reminded me of the fact that Al-Qaeda's stated position, its stated purpose vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States was in fact to uh, create grave, acute, and chronic harm to us financially. And so by that measure, they have been extraordinarily successful. Hmm. And uh, interesting that, um, and I think Moynihan was right, and so interesting that the, the, the terrorists uh, are, are doing, you know, we're killing terrorists for doing what we're doing to ourselves. Okay, I want to say a few things about uh, relationship between war and capitalism, and at one point I'll need to say a little bit about what capitalism is. And I'll be brief <clears throat> so we can answer questions you may have. First, there are two basic uh, traditions in the modern world uh, in respect to spelling out the relationship between war and uh, capitalism. And so the first uh, a, a tradition is, is it comes to us from the rise of modernity itself with the rise of liberalism, the most uh, powerful uh, advocate of this view is among Kant, and it is that trade brings peace. So just to the degree that governments and societies uh, engage in commerce with each other, they will have reason to be at peace with each other. This is a tenet of the democratic peace tradition or peace theory. Because of course you wouldn't wound, you wouldn't harm someone who's profitable to you. It's in your own self-interest not to uh, act violently towards someone 
who's uh, making you, making your life better, if, if not making you rich. The other tradition is the tradition that is radical uh, and or socialist. It emerges from critical theory, from Lenin and others which uh, tells us that, in fact, uh, on balance, trade brings violence, not peace. And that's true just insofar as trade is conducted, uh, conducted under hegemonic uh, control of capitalist states and their representative imperialist, respected imperialist tendencies. And so, uh, both of these accounts, both of these theories, have some empirical historical cases they use for validation. Uh, but I think that just insofar as trade is fair, transparent, uh, honest, uh, and does not violate moral norms, uh, and uh, is uh, mutually agreed upon by all affected peoples, um, it, it can be uh, valuable for creating conditions of peace, or may be said to be a kind of um, instance of peace. But just insofar as trade is imperialistic, unfair, not transparent, not democratic, and is in fact a way for uh, the world's powerful elites to have control over, to oppress, to exploit, uh, to gain unfairly from uh, peoples and uh, interests, parties in the world, then uh, it does indeed, I think, uh, create violence. Not only creates the conditions for violence, but is itself violence. So what I want to say in, in brief is that capitalism is violence. And uh, I want to say a little bit about what capitalism is uh, and, uh, and then come back to this. Uh, okay. So what do I mean by capitalism? Very briefly, a lot to be said, of course, and, and, and many of you in this room uh, are quite capable of um, producing a very eloquent and, uh, and uh, meaningful summary of capitalism, but I just want to say uh, six things about it. First, that because capitalism is a system of exchange that is oriented to profit, it's about making profit, and therefore suppresses labor or oppresses labor, uh, diminishes in any number of ways the value, uh, the health, the integrity, the well-being of labor, it is uh, immoral and a system of exploitation, objectification, commodification, alienation, and so on. Secondly, I want to say that uh, capitalism uh, fosters a myth and um, exists upon the myth of a free market. And there is no such thing as a free market, and indeed, capitalist powers operate with a great deal of help, a great deal of assistance, assistance and enabling from very coercive, very powerful interests, uh, most, mostly states that prop free markets up. And so there's nothing free about them. And uh, those uh, powers that create so-called free markets are themselves coercive, unjust, oppressive, undemocratic, uh, inegalitarian, and uh, often violent themselves. Third, I want to say that a piece of capital, capitalism is its fetishization of property. There is a fetishism which is uh, religious, it's faith-based, it's um, idolatry, to use a theological term. It is um, mythical and powerful. Uh, it is fantastical. The um, narratives we use, the rhetoric we use, the beliefs we have, such that our lives are only worth living 
just to the degree that we can aggrandize our lives by appropriating property to ourselves and keeping property from others. So the role of property is not simply that you know you have a right to own something. It's that the role of property has this um, powerful shaman-like um, life-guiding power uh, in our lives, whether we recognize it or not. And of course, most people don't recognize it. And uh, that is a piece uh, intrinsically of capitalism. Fourth thing I want to say that the market is godlike. Uh, you might argue, as many have, that it is in fact a god, or that capitalism is in fact a religion. And this can be uh, argued on many fronts, but let me just say on one of them, I'll speak to one of them briefly, and that is the totalizing uh, logic of the market, uh, which is recognized not only by the critics of capitalism, but by its advocates as well. So for example, Milton Friedman spoke of total capitalism in an admiring, aspirational sort of way. And so the idea is, is that the commodification of everything, the uh, buying and selling of everything, reducing everything to or in order exchange and all its calculations and consequences, uh, is, is a logic that has no proper end. It has no proper end. I wrote recently in, 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 a, in a book chapter that when you're, not that I've ever played golf, but I understand that on some golf courses you could lean over to take your ball out of the hole and there'd be an ad there at the bottom of the hole. <laughs> or, you know, when we sell advertising on school buses or, or on the TV screens in, in classrooms, or even when people say tattoo on their body, Ad, ads, they use their bodies as ad spaces. When these sorts of things happen, you hear complaints against it from some quarters as though it's just gone too far. But what I said is, from the logic of capitalism itself, the, the question is, what took so long? You know, why? There's nothing sacred about the body, there's nothing sacred about school children. You know, it's all space to be used it was for the golf. commodification of everything. It was about golf, you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But golf is sacred, yes. For some people, that's probably true. <laughs> um, the fifth thing I want to say about capitalism is that it assumes scarcity. And it not only assumes it generally, but then many capitalist advocates write that capitalism is, in fact, an order of exchange in a world of scarcity. But I believe that we, in fact, live in a world of abundance. So the pretense we have this scarcity is just an excuse to keep goods from some people. That, that's what I believe the, the, at ultimately the discourse of scarcity is all about. Uh, sixth and lastly, I want to say that capitalism is a misappropriation of desire and the technologies of desire, and that it arcs toward nihilism, or it perhaps is at bottom nihilism. And that is to say that the logic of capitalism is, at bottom, the claim that nothing matters. That everything is for sale, purchase, uh, everything is um, uh, a piece of uh, the world to be used as leverage vis-a-vis -vis other persons. And that's all that matters. And if that's all that matters, nothing really matters. So the, this, these are, in my view, and more can be said about this, of course, and as I said, many of you in this room could do so, but these are six uh, intrinsic components of capitalism uh, as I understand it. And I believe that those dimensions of capitalism and capitalism uh, as such, then, is actually a system of violence. It not only creates the conditions for violence, which is obvious enough to many people, but is in fact itself violence. And so it does indeed foster war directly and indirectly. Now I want to briefly uh, mention a theoretical construct created by Johann Galtung, a uh, G-A-L-T-U-N, 
a Norwegian um, social scientist who is thought of as the, uh, he's clearly a pioneer in, in peace studies. And he uh, writes about cultural violence, structural violence, and direct violence. And I want to briefly say that capitalism creates violence in cultures. It creates the conditions in cultures that give rise to violence. That capitalism then is a form of structural violence. And you mentioned have some aspects of that and we can go on and on about how it appears. Uh, but then also direct violence is the kind of violence uh, we see when someone pulls out a weapon and fires it at another person or plants a mine and the mine explodes or drops bombs and so on, where weaponry that is uh, designed for military purposes is used. That's direct violence. And whereas capitalism has often called upon the forces that use direct violence to, in its employ, it's important to note, as I've been saying, that capitalism also creates and, again, is itself a form of, I believe, cultural and structural violence. So, I don't know if those concepts help you at all, but I'll, I'll leave that there. And then let me very briefly turn to this matter of, of war profiteering. <coughs> now, everyone here knows that uh, Eisenhower, in his last address to the country, here's this uh, general who was the commander of Allied forces in Europe uh, at the end of World War II and had become president, uh, spoke about the military-industrial complex and warned the United States against it. And uh, we now live, of course, in a military-industrial media education, religious, cultural, artistic, what am I leaving out? industrial complex, right? I mean, it's a complex of a lot of things. And it's uh, powerful, which goes again to why I think capitalism is itself violence, both in structural and cultural ways. And this is an interesting thing to me, and um, I'm interested in what you think about what I'm about to say. But it's my view that all of the wars that the U.S. has engaged in until 9-11 could be explained. I don't think the explanations were justifiable, but they were explained. They were there were they were they were generally salient or coherent arguments about their necessity for on on moral grounds or political grounds. You know, they were wars of defense. They were wars to stop tyranny and so on. But I think the most powerful arguments that can now be made about war post 9/11, particularly in Iraq but in Afghanistan too, and elsewhere, is that it makes a lot of money. And so, what we've done, and Don Rumsfeld is, is the paradynamic figure in this case, because he set out to do this very thing. He set out to transform, utterly transform, radically transform the Pentagon, so as to, to tie it in innumerable ways to private interests. So that to fight a war, to be prepared to fight a war, to convey the technologies of war, the assemblages of war, the rhetoric of war, made a lot of money for a lot of people. And so, whereas war profiteering has always been seen from ancient times as a treasonous, darkly immoral human practice. Because it was just simply seen for what it was. People making money off of the misery and deaths of other people. Now, making money, at least in our country, off of the misery and deaths of other people is ubiquitous, it is uh, dynamic, it is fluid, it is ever more unquestioned and valorized. It's just business as usual, in an entirely undisguised and unfettered way. I think, you know, that 9-11 has made the world 
not much different as we keep claiming it has in a number of ways, but in some ways it has made the world considerably different. And this seems to me to be a tripwire or a threshold we've crossed, where now we do not have a category of shame for war profiteering. It's just what you do, and you'd be stupid not to get into it. Right? So I think something very fundamental and radical has taken place and uh, it is the um, unadulterated normalization of war profiteering, which I think, given the long arc of human history, is probably a, an extraordinary exception to the norms of human behavior and, norm and, 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 and human expectations uh, among all cultures. So those are a few words about what I see to be the relationship between capitalism and violence, capitalism and war, and a few more words about war profiteering. So thank you. Could I, could I uh, do a follow-up to his last, on the, on the war profiteering, it, it, that's a very interesting point. Um, it used to be that uh, soldiers would have to peel potatoes, but nobody made a profit on that. So soldiers don't peel potatoes anymore. They have a private contractor and they bring in food. The army used to feed itself, prepare its own food. Right. And they have private contractors for that. You have private contractors for much of all, all the equipment and all. But the ultimate now is private merc mercenaries right. coming in. Yeah. We, we, used to, we used to use word mercenary as a term of degradation. Yeah, this they put you down and say, yeah. you're acting like a mercenary. That's so mercenary of you. Now you're, again, if you are a member of Black, what was Blackwater, it's now XE. Mm -hmm. But when your name is still dirty enough, you just change it. That's why they're not Blackwater. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Yeah, but now we, we, uh, we honor those folks too. So, uh, And yeah. they get paid a hell of a lot more. Yeah. The average GI makes, what, $300 a week or something? Right. Yeah. These guys get a thousand two, two, three thousand dollars yeah. a day? They, a they also can act without impunity in a way that a soldier in uniform can't. Yeah, they can act with impunity. With impunity, yeah, yeah, excuse yeah. me. I mean, they right. just yeah. get away with mm -hmm. so much. Anyway. So if there are any questions, feel free to ask or comment. We, we took care of everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you're right, that war isn't only something that sort of emanates from the government of the United States and from the, the state and the apparatus that it has externally, but that there's a kind of internal targeting of U.S. citizens and persons inside the U.S. that is concomitant. I mean, it's a part of the war, and it goes to matters of surveillance and matters of, again, uh, for example, prison, we're privatizing prisons as well as everything else. And then you have the owners of the largest private prisons lobbying for anti-immigrant legislation because, of course, that's the production of prisoners, which is the production of profit. And that's another example. We could go on and on about examples of what you're saying, but I, but I just think you're right that that there is a part of the war on terror, whatever that is, right, that is a war with, that is a domestic war. And it, it is not only what's happening, but what people are preparing for. For example, um, the command structure of the army has changed, and so I forget exactly which command it is, but I think there's a North American command structure that's been created 
in the event that the uh, U.S. military needs to use its force against U.S. citizens. This is all in military planning. So in other words, looking toward the future, the near future, the Pentagon is also planning strategically how to use its forces on the ground in Utah, if need be. So that's a piece of it too. So I, I appreciate your comment, I, and I, I basically just agree with it, and I, and I think a whole book could be written about this. Yeah? So then to follow up, though, what do you suggest that we do? Because obviously there are all of these things, and capitalism has created all of these tremendously awful situations, but you, like, what do you suggest that we do? I mean, because we can talk about it, like it's interesting, but what do we do? Well, I think educational institutions are, 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 are very uh, good and potentially powerful locations for resistance. And so more of, for example, what you're doing today and tomorrow is good in you know, informing and educating and conscious raising, as we used to say. But I also think at some point there needs to be some, some general strikes that are really, you know, uh, at, at a minimum, minimum several hundred thousand of us need to participate in over a long period of time, but, but probably some millions of us need to participate in over long periods of time. And, um, you know, I, I, I think general strikes that are very, very uh, widely participated in over over uh, where, where people have the commitment to stay in the strike for a long time. That's the way, I think, to bring the country, to bring the state, to bring certain uh, powers to their knees. That's what I think has to happen. How that will get organized and how, how it would be put into effect, I can't say. By the way, I, I, I draw on research for this. I'll re mention only one book. It's a new book by Chenoweth and Stephan, S-T-E-P-H-A-N, called uh, How or Why Civil Resistance Works, just published by Columbia, where, where there's a great deal of data that shows this to be a truly powerful form of civil resistance on, on a global scale. Yeah, we just saw civil resistance bring down the government in Egypt, which was remarkable. Nobody, nobody predicted that at all. Um, <clears throat> there are surprising things in the American public. Uh, on the eve of the Gulf War, the American public was something like 70% against uh, engaging in the war. And there was a poll taken, and it read something like, if Saddam Hussein has nuclear weapons, the term, the term uh, weapons of mass destruction hadn't quite come into vogue yet, but he said if, if he has a nuclear bomb or something, uh, would you be prepared to uh, take action against him? Then, then that 70% melted away and it was sort of 60 something percent the other way or 70% the other way. And so then they started hitting on this what, nuclear bomb, he's worse than Hitler, he's crazy. He has uh, massive weapons of mass destruction. And, and that got the public in, again, playing on their fear and survival. But don't for, don't for any minute think that your government, your government, uh, the capitalist government, don't think for, for a minute that they don't care what you think. You hear people say, well, they don't care what we think. They care, they care all the time. That's the only thing they care about you. They don't care if you eat or what you eat. They don't care if you're going to be healthy. They don't care if you're breathing poison, toxic air. They don't care if you can't afford your rent and all that. They don't care anything. About the one thing they care about you is what you're thinking. And every day, every day there's an agenda of how do we keep this issue here, that issue there, this policy defined in this way. How do we make sure the public see this? Because they understand that they, they stay in power on, your, on our backs. That you know they're riding, they're, they're riding the stallion, and they can get thrown off. They're, they're the, the apex of the pyramid, and if the base begins to really move, that the the apex 
uh, begins to tremble indeed. So, um, mass, we may not have seen the end of mass action, you know. I, I remember days when there were 300 demonstrations at 300 camp, college campuses all went out on strike. Uh, this was during the Vietnam era in May 1970. Um, those are things we could never have predicted. But, but uh, knowing and, and, and also asking why, not just denouncing these things, but asking why this is this way, invites you into making an analysis and having a, a, a narrative as to what is really going on and who's doing what. And that gives you a stronger and better understanding. And that's what the, the American left actually lacks. It is so involved in particular issues, uh, you know, fight for better housing, for poverty, or against poverty, and save the whales, whatever. All very good and vital and urgent issues. Um, and, and a lot of people just don't stop to say, why is this going on this way? Why is such a rich country having such a problem with this, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and learning to develop an, an, an analysis that, that's, that has an ideological component to it. <clears throat> um, yeah, this question is mostly directed to uh, you, Dr. Mitch, but is also open to uh, uh, Dr. Parenti. Um, if, if it's a question of violence, uh, could we debate on a moral or a philosophical ground uh, whether or not class war is is uh, more or less ethical because it's breaking this overarching, you know, system systemic uh, hegemonic violence that is existing in our everyday life. Well, when I think of the when I hear the word class war, or class warfare used in our country, it's of course used by people who are practicing it as a as a uh, charge leveled against people who are simply identifying it. So <laughs> it's an interesting thing, but um, I think, I think uh, I'll say two things very briefly. One is that the kind of class war that is fostered in this country is another example of what, what you said to us back there. You said, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but I think you're identifying that the wars turned inward domestically too. Is, this is another way that it happens. Um, but if you're asking me if, um, a, a literal kind of violence um, propagated by the underclass against the um, ruling class or the capitalist elites is morally justified. Uh, I think it's not morally justified for reasons that go to <laughs> so many of you. We talked about this. Um, I also think it's, it's really it would be extraordinarily ineffectual. It would be even if you believed it would be morally justified, it, it would be the, it would be just strategically stupid. That's mine. In, in the United States, if that's what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And Prem, um, Mr. Parenti, do you also have a, a view on, on that? On, on what specifically? Just on, uh, like uh, Dr. Mitchell was talking about, his call for class war, uh, the underclass overthrowing the, uh, the rich elites in the United States. And, and on a moral and philosophical frame, could it be justified? And B, uh, would it be effectual? which I thought were important points pointed out. Well, I, I don't know why it's morally unacceptable. Uh, I can understand groups like the Black Panthers and the Young Lords and other groups that were even beginning to coalesce and all that. Uh, but I think, I think they'd love it. I think the powers that be would love it because they give them opportunity to kill, to kill everybody in sight. And that's what they did. To, to the Panthers, they just systematically kill them. So you can't get too far ahead of your base, and you need a base. And the, the real thing that terrifies them is not, not activating the underclass, I guess you mean the poorest of the poor, I guess, right? Uh, but um, the real, their real fear is to get to the great mass of white working class connecting with, 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 with these people and all these people connecting with the middle class. In other words, a, a front of all the variously oppressed peoples, which is most of the population. And, and that's what we would need to be doing. Uh, and that might also take uh, militancy and confrontations and civil disobedience, as you said. 
I, I would add very, uh, I'll, I'll add that I, I, I supported what the weathermen or the weather underground were doing or uh, seeking to do. And if like every Hummer in the United States sitting on a lot instantaneously burst into flames, you know, on, I don't know, you know, May 1st, 2012 <laughs> or something at 4 in the afternoon, you know, <laughs> that I would cheer. Uh, I have no, I have no, I, I, I have no more. I'm just trying to plant ideas without having to take ownership of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I've got tenure, but you know, I don't have everything yet. Yeah. Uh, 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 you, you know, I think that I, I don't. I have no moral compunction about about destroying property and such. I have a moral uh, compunction about uh, putting bullets through people's heads, uh, and and there's a and it's not. I don't think it's simplistic. I think it's also a very thick and complex moral objection, uh, which has many dimensions. But one dimension is I don't know where you'd stop. Yeah. You know because there's a whole lot of people who are complicit, and I don't know how you pick off just the proper twelve or two hundred twelve people, and so. Well, I, and I didn't uh, mean for it to be too tangential to get into debating yeah. moral and uh, you know ethics and, and philosophy and everything, but uh, I did think it was a, a very pertinent point uh, that uh, Dr. Prenti made when you when you talked about uh, the empire sucks from the republic, right? So it seems to me I said feeds off. Oh, excuse me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a much better rhetoric. <laughs> But I, I think, as far as the anti-war movement is concerned, there should be this linking up with uh, not just anti-war as such, but anti-imperialist. At least, at least that's my particular view. Uh, could could we maybe play off off that a little more? Because again, it would connect with you know themes of capitalism and everything. Yeah, I mean, I do this all the time. I try to appeal when I talk to community groups and all this that they're being played for suckers. That there's no interest of theirs in Iraq and Afghanistan and these places. Uh, but there is an interest now, which is that all their money is being spent and their blood is being spent in, in these far off places. And, um, and, and so to try to talk to people to their self-interest, I mean, and they don't, they don't have a sense of what their self-interest is. They've been told, and it's very discouraging because some, some of them will see something on TV hear something said, and they internalize it, and then repeat it like it's their own. I call it the parrot syndrome, you know? Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and it happens not just with those middle Americans, it happens with all sorts of politically literate people on the left who have decided that, uh, who now have decided that Gaddafi has to go because he's not a humanitarian in, in Libya. Um, and, and when you ask them, they, uh, you know, they're standing shoulder to shoulder with the CIA, the Pentagon, and the White House, and, and, the, and NATO, and, uh, and suddenly, and they don't see something wrong here. So I think, I think um, we, there's a vast, a vast need to educate, and, 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 um, and education has to be specific and right to the point, and, and to show people how these, these policies are not at all in their interest by any definition of self-interest. All right, well, we're coming up on the end of the hour, so I'd like to uh, have all of you join me in giving both uh, both the Michaels, Franti, and Mitch a hand. <laughs> <laughs>